Hey Chapel, I hope you guys are having a great Easter Sunday. Uh, we're so glad that you have decided to join us for our online worship experience today. Um, hope that your families are doing well and staying healthy. Uh, hope you guys are gathered around, just uh, ready to worship the Lord together. Um, it's such an incredible uh, Sunday today, um, uh, just celebrating the risen King. Uh, so I'm going to pray and then we can get, uh, get started in worship. Uh, but let's pray together right now uh, as a family. Lord, we love you. And we just thank you so much, uh, Lord, for your son, Jesus. God, we thank you for the sacrifice that he made on the cross for our sins. Lord, we thank you for the life that we have in you. Lord, we thank you for the blood that washes away our sins, Lord. And we thank you that you died for us. So we just worship you this morning. We just say thank you this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
there once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the Savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we bow the one who Sing it out, your name. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King.
Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. I left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Come on, church family. Can we, can we do that right now? Can we praise the one who paid our debt? Can we praise the one, just for a moment, who raised up from the dead for us? Can we just take a second and wherever you are, just close your eyes and just focus in on the Lord. God, thank you. 
thank you for sending your son for each and every one of us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. But God, you sent your son Jesus for all of us. And we are grateful for that today. We celebrate that today. And we're grateful that, God, it didn't end at the cross. But God, there is an empty tomb today. There is a a Savior in heaven that is looking forward to coming back and getting his people one day. God, we celebrate you today. Thank you for this service. Thank you for meeting us here in worship. And thank you that we save that we worship a risen Savior today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, welcome in, Chapel family. We are so glad that you're with us today. I'm Anthony, and what a beautiful time of, of worship. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that time of worship. And I just want to say, Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Hey, look at somebody close and tell them, say, Happy Easter. It is Easter Sunday. It is Resurrection Sunday, and we get to celebrate together today. There's a a few things I know about today. First of all, this will be an Easter Sunday that that we never forget. Uh, This will be an Easter Sunday that, that stands head and shoulders above every other Easter Sunday that we've celebrated. But I also know this about this day, that the tomb is empty. And that we serve a risen Savior. And I also know this, that wherever you are today, that our God, our Savior, is with you. So whether you're you're in the living room together as a family, whether you're on the the back porch watching this on a phone or a TV or an iPad, wherever you are, I know this, that He is with you today. So thank you again for being with us here in this service. We may be scattered in different places today, but you are not worshiping alone. We are all worshiping together today. I want to thank you for your generosity during this season. You have been so good and so faithful and so generous during this time that we're all walking through together right now. And I want to encourage you to give again today. You can give by going to our website, wearechapel.org, and click on the Give tab. You can also give by texting the amount you want to give to the number 84321. And then right now in the comments, you can click on that link, and that'll take you to a section of our website where you can give in this moment. You know, David, he encouraged the people to, to bring an offering to bring an offering so that in the Old Testament they could rebuild the temple. And in in 1 Corinthians, actually 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 9, he said this, or it says this, it says that the people rejoiced because they had given willingly, for with a whole heart they had given to the Lord. And today I want to encourage you to do that. Give willingly with a whole heart and see God bless your gift today. Can we pray over our offering? Father, thank you. Thank you that today we get to give back a portion of what you've blessed us with. God, and I pray that as we give this back to you today, God, you would take it. God, we don't want our name attached to it. God, we don't want Chapel's name attached to it. We want your name attached to it. We want it to make an impact for your kingdom. So thank you for doing that today. Bless our offering today in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got a special treat for you today. Uh, We want to thank a a group of ladies that have worked really hard and given their time to provide a special element for our Easter Sunday today. We especially want to thank Natalie Holly. She has given so much time and sacrificed so much to put this all together. So take a moment, sit back, relax, and enjoy this special Easter dance today.
All right. Thank you so much for gathering with us on Sunday morning. We miss all of you guys, miss your beautiful faces. And so if you could do us a favor, help us see you on Easter. Take a family photo, whether you get dressed up in your Sunday best or in your pajamas, whatever you're doing, and just tag it or hashtag it, Chapel Easter 2020, because we want to see your beautiful faces, and we cannot wait to gather with you in person again. And we also, we don't want you just to view uh, this program or view our worship experience. We want to engage with you and help serve you during this crazy, crazy time the best way we possibly can. And so if you do us a favor, there should be a next steps or a check-in connect card on the tab or in the link uh, in the comments. If you would fill that out, we want everybody to fill that out. If you're good, just toggle, I'm good. If you need help or prayer, hit that and, and let us know what we can pray with you for and also how we can serve you and your family best. We want to engage with you and serve you the best possible way we can. And it is Easter, and I know it's a little bit different. I know worshiping from home is a little bit different. Try being me with four teenage kids trying to watch dad preach with dad in the room. So our kids are trying to act like they're falling asleep. Last week, RJ kept falling asleep, and I was like, what's wrong? I kept, get up, man. I was like, this dude's preaching really good. You need to pay attention to what he's saying. And he kept falling asleep, and he got up early with me to help fix breakfast. I said, get up, and I kept getting on to him, and, and I don't know if you're having to deal with that or not, but then I realized his allergies are really bad. And so I'd given him two Benadryl earlier that morning. So here I drugged the kid up, and he's falling asleep. Now I'm yelling at him, but that is the best he behaved in church ever since he was born. So maybe your family worship experience is like ours, but it is Easter. I know it's, it's different, but I do believe this is more similar to the original Easter than any other Easter we've ever had. When you think about the first Easter Sunday, there wasn't a large crowd of people gathered. There wasn't an Easter egg hunt to go to. There wasn't a photo op or photo shoot with the Easter bunny. There wasn't Sunday best clothes or pastel colors. Literally, it was just a few disciples who showed up at the tomb discovered the tomb was empty, and went and started sharing the good news. And maybe God has given us this opportunity to get rid of all the other stuff, get rid of the traditions and, and the church services, and get back to the real meaning of Easter, of learning and discovering an empty tomb and going and sharing that good news with other people. And I think there's no better time than now for good news. We have enough bad news out there. We have enough stuff going on. We have enough television news and social media news. It's time for good news for a change. And Easter is all about the good news. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to hear how Peter describes the gospel. The one who experienced the gospel, the one who walked with Jesus, the one who saw the resurrected Jesus, the one the church was built upon. He starts sharing the gospel with this church. He says in verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. Not our great works, not our great ability, not our great looks, but his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again, born brand new, new creations in Christ, brand new, born again to what? A living hope through the resurrection. Our hope is in the resurrection. Our hope is built on a living foundation of the fact Jesus is not dead, he is alive. He says the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to what? To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Meaning it's never going to rust, never going to be corroded. It will last forever, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is a powerful scripture. He's saying, by his great mercy, we are born again. And we're born again to a living hope through his resurrection to an inheritance that will never pass away. And then we'll be tested in this genuineness of our faith in order to receive the fulfillment of this living hope, which is when Jesus comes back again. And I don't know about you, but it's not Friday. It's not Saturday. It is Sunday. And regardless of what you're going through, it is no longer Good Friday. And I, our kids have been messed up with what day of the week it is. They don't know if it's Sunday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesday. There's no schedule. I even saw a guy this week 
who was video on social media. He had his kids out at the bus stop, and he's putting it on his phone, recording it. And he told them the school bus is on the way. Now, their school's been canceled for the rest of the year. And the kids were out there. He's putting it on social media because they didn't know what day it was. And he, it was April 1st or Fool's Day. And you may think that's a little mad for a dad uh, to do, but I actually, that's kind of my role model now <laughs> to be that dad to kind of set up. But, you know, our kids forget what day it is. And many times as Christians, we forget that we're Sunday Christians. We're not Good Friday Christians. Good Friday was full of chaos and sorrow and grief and pain and frustration. Like when you think Peter's writing this, Peter on Good Friday denied Christ. Peter ran away. Peter was uh, succumbed with grief and sorrow. And maybe some of you, you're in a season of grief and sorrow and pain, frustration. Or maybe you're the silent Saturday Christian where it's full of confusion, doubt, unbelief. What do we do now? Peter had all his hopes placed in, in, in this kingdom of God that, that he was preaching, that Jesus was preaching, and now that kingdom has passed away. And so maybe you're in a season, what now? What do I do next? What do I do after COVID? What am I going to do with my faith? What am I going to do with my life? But we have to remember, we're not Friday Christians. We're not Saturday Christians. It is Sunday. And Sunday has come, and Sunday is brand new. And Peter's telling this church, Peter's a person who knew what hope looked like. He walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He performed miracles with Jesus. He knew what hope looked like, but he also knew what it was to lose hope. When he placed his hope in Jesus as a, as a politician, a, as a revolutionary, he lost that hope on Good Friday. And he's talking to this church, and he's telling them, listen, trials are going to come. Suffering is going to come. And, and many of us, we, we, our, our dangers, our frustrations are usually in lost hope. That we've placed our hope in certain people or certain things, or certain dreams, or certain ideas. And when those hopes aren't met, or those expectations aren't met, it causes danger to our hearts and our souls. Or maybe like this church, maybe they thought they were going to sign up for Christianity, or sign up for the gospel, or sign up for the church, and once they did, everything would get better. There, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more frustration, and now they're living a life of exile, where they're being persecuted seeing family members murdered and persecuted and killed and martyred, seeing people with sickness, seeing their families disown them, and there's, Peter's trying to bring them back to this point of the gospel. The gospel is full of hope. He knew about it, and Peter knew that he placed his hopes in Jesus as a revolutionary, and he realized after the resurrection, he placed his hopes in the wrong place. He realized at one point that he had placed his hopes in the wrong place, place and maybe you maybe you maybe we are looking for hope in all the wrong places Luke chapter 24 a couple of women come to the tomb of Jesus and as they come he's not there and here's what the angel said while they were perplexed about this behold two men stood by them day in days dazzling apparel and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground the men said to them why do you seek the living among the dead he is not here and I believe us I think Peter was looking for hope in dead places. He was looking for a government. He was looking for a political movement. And political movements come and they go. Maybe you, you're placing your hope in your career. That's going to be a dead place. Your career will come and go. Business is open and closed. Maybe like Judas, you're placing your hopes in your security of finances. Finances come, finances go. The stock market goes up, the stock market goes down. Inflation comes, inflation goes, maybe you're placing your hope in your family or your kids. Your kids will grow up, they'll leave the house. People live, people die. Maybe you're placing your hope in a politician or a government or a political party. They come and they go. Everything we place our hope in is a temporary location. It's all dying. We look for hope in places that are dying. And Peter in the scripture is trying to say, listen, our hope is not dead. Our hope is alive. See, Christianity is not a religion of the tomb. It is not a religion of death. It's not a religion of, of, of the grave. Christianity is a religion of the resurrection. The disciples did not go around and preach the tomb. The disciples went around and preached the resurrected Christ. They preached Jesus resurrected. Why? We're not looking for hope in dead places. We're looking for hope in the living hope of Jesus. See, hope has a name. 
And its name is not a government. Its name is not riches. Its name is not temporary things. Hope has a name, and its name is Jesus. And when you place your hope and your dreams in Jesus, it will always be fulfilled. That's why we have, we have to quit looking for hope in all the dead places. Because hope is not dead. We've got to quit placing our hope in people and things and riches and possessions and organizations and governments. Those are all dying. We have to quit looking for hope in dead places because hope is not dead. Hope is alive. That is what Easter is about. Hope is alive. And listen, the Pharisees tried to shut hope up. Their whole, while Jesus was walking on earth preaching hope of the kingdom, the Pharisees tried to shut him up and get him to stop, and they could not shut him up. The, the, Satan tried to put him on a cross and kill hope, but they could not kill hope. Even the Romans tried to put guards and put him in a tomb and contain hope to the tomb. They went so far as to put a big stone and sealed the tomb with clay, with the seal of Caesar. So if anyone broke into it, they would know it was a thief. They would know hope was not real. They were trying to keep hope in. Then they put an entire Roman guard in front of the tomb to keep hope locked up. Roman guard, 16 soldiers. They had to stand six feet apart, just like social distancing. They had six feet they had to take care of. And if one of them fell asleep, they would take him and burn him with his clothes on. If he fell asleep and missed his duty, the entire 16-person guard would be killed. The Romans wanted to make sure that this resurrected Jesus would never be resurrected. They wanted to make sure hope stayed locked inside the tomb. But listen, you cannot lock hope away. You cannot shut it up and you cannot kill it because hope is alive. Thank God hope is alive. There's nothing like hope. Hope can move you forward. Hope can keep you dreaming. Hope can keep you praying. Hope can keep you loving. Hope can keep you reaching. Hope is alive. It's moving. It's interactive. It's energetic. It's going in a certain place. And you know what? I'm happy. Because as long as we have hope, we have good news to preach. And in our world, it's time to have some good news. And the disciples in the first Easter, all they did was go and say, He's alive. Hope is alive. Our dreams are alive. Our purpose is alive because we serve a God with living hope. Living, eternal hope. And Peter's trying to nail this down to this letter to this church. He says, you serve a God with a living hope. And my living hope secures in us a spiritual inheritance. It secures in us a spiritual inheritance. This is what he says. He says it's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. That's an inheritance. An inheritance is something someone else earns or works for to get, and they give it to somebody else, not based off any work they do or based off any ability they have. The only reason they receive the inheritance is based off a relationship they have with somebody. So with our kids, Toy and I's kids, they don't earn anything at our house. Like, they're living off our sacrifice, our hard work, our savings, our, like, they're living at our house, not because they earned their way there, but because of a relationship they have with us. I work for it. Toya works for it. That's why if you touch the thermostat in my house, you didn't work to turn that thing on. You better not touch it. Turn those lights off. Shut that door. Why are you holding the refrigerator door open? Shut that thing. Find out what you want before it. Why? I'm working for it. But my kids, due to a relationship with me, get to partake in my inheritance. Right now they get a small glimpse of it, but when I pass away, when Toy passes away, it all becomes theirs. We didn't earn any of our inheritance. Jesus earned it. He did the work. He paid the price. He did the duty. He did everything. And he says, I'm going to give you an inheritance, not based off what you did, but because of our relationship. And he says this is a, 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 an inheritance that's imperishable. It's, it's all lasting. It, you can't tear it up. It's being guarded by Jesus. Can you think of an inheritance that inflation can't touch, taxes can't touch, 
It won't rust. It won't fade away. It's eternal. And I think really what this is trying to say is contrary to popular opinion, this inheritance, the gospel, the good news, doesn't promise us our best possible life now. Like Peter's talking to people in suffering. He's talking to people who are going through trials and tribulations. He's talking to people being martyred and persecuted. And he's talking about an inheritance. And what he's saying is the good news is not your best possible life now. The good news is your best possible life in eternity. Where it's imperishable, where it's unfading, where it's undefiled. He's saying we have something to look forward to. And it is an inheritance that is beyond measure. And he says, you'll get a little bit, just like with our kids, you'll get a little bit of it now and a little bit of it later. Or a little bit of it now and all of it later. In Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, Paul is talking. He says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel or the good news of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So he's saying, I'm going to give you a small portion of my inheritance. I'm going to give you a small portion of my kingdom now through my spirit. You're going to be able to feel the imperishable kingdom of God. You're going to taste the beauty of an undefiled, pure presence of God. He's going to give us portions of the kingdom through the Holy Spirit. So that way when we're going through life now, we can actually have on earth as it is in heaven. If I need joy, joy is there. If I need hope, hope is there. If I need love, love is there. If I need peace, peace is there. But then I'll get the rest of it when I walk into heaven. I get a foretaste now. When I get to heaven, it's complete peace, complete joy, complete love. It's all there, not because of anything I did, but because everything Jesus did. We have an inheritance to look forward to, and that is good news for a change. When you're laid off from your job, you don't know how you're going to pay your bills, you have an inheritance that is imperishable, that's undefiled, that's unfading. That is good news for a change. Then Peter tells them, he says, listen, our our living hope is going to be tested for authenticity. Our living hope will be tested for authenticity. Well, why is that part of the good news? Well, if God has an inheritance he's going to give us that's undefiled, that's perfect, that's unblemished, if he's going to give us this amazing inheritance, he wants to make sure the people he gives it to actually receive it in an undefiled, pure way. He wants to make sure that the gift is equal to the receiver, and the receiver actually wants to receive the gift. That's why any faith has to be tested in order to receive a spiritual inheritance. Meaning if God wants to give you great things, he's going to test you first to make sure you can handle those great things. I I think that's a a good thing. That means if I'm going through trials and tribulations, it means God is going to trust me with more on the backside. So in our family, I don't know about yours, our kids are now four teenagers in our house, which is chaos. We're losing money daily by all the groceries we have to buy and try to feed these little hood rats that live in our house. And so we have four kids, three older daughters, one son. And so we've talked about dating forever with them, their future spouses, their husbands, their wives. What's our plan for dating? And so literally, I know Toya does and I I do. We pray for their future spouses every single day. One, because we know their future spouses will need all the help they can get. But two, we pray that right now, whoever those people are, they're in families that are raising them in the house of God. They're in families that are teaching them how to treat their wife as a bride, as a gift from God. Teaching their daughters how to love and encourage her godly husband. I'm praying these things into realization so we're not going to partake in the cultural standards of dating. Because we believe dating is qualifying for marriage. In culture, that's why you have young girls who literally, when they date, they act like they're married. They give all their time to each other. They may give their their heart to one another. They may give their bodies to one another. And then when they break up, it's literally like a divorce. So we have a whole generation of young people that before they walk into their actual first marriage, they've been married and divorced multiple times with depression and heartbreak and emotional abuse and turmoil. And so we want to make sure before our kids walk in the dating game, they're ready to get married because dating is qualifying 
for marriage. So why would I try to qualify for marriage if I'm not ready to get married? And so when they start dating, when you start dating, you start with somebody that has the potential to be your future husband or wife. Then you start qualifying them or testing them to see if their love is genuine and true enough to receive the inheritance of your life. Testing them to see if they can handle the imperishable, undefiled, pure love that you want to give them. So why would I ever, as a person, want to give my heart and my life to somebody that hasn't been tested? In the same way, in this scripture, Peter's saying, listen, your faith will be tested. Why? God is trying to give you his entire heart. He's trying to give you his entire kingdom. He wants to make sure you can handle it and that your faith is genuine because we know there's some faith that's genuine and some that is false. And that which is false can't handle an inheritance that's imperishable. It can't handle an inheritance that's pure and undefiled. And so God loves us to go through testing seasons to determine our level of, of genuineness or our level of faith. And I think what's amazing about that is that as you're being tested, as you're going through trials, as he's talking here, Peter is to the church, that you know there's something on the other side of your trial or your test. Meaning, if God's letting me be tested, it's like a sponge. If you ever have a sponge and you fill it up with water, when you squeeze that sponge, whatever's inside the sponge will come out. Whatever's in there, if it's water. And so I think God allows us to go through testing seasons or that squeezing of trials to start letting stuff out so we can see what's actually on the inside of us. And the more he tests us, the more the world gets squeezed out of us. The more of our sin that gets squeezed out of us. The more of our fears that get squeezed out of us. The more of our issues that get squeezed out of us until nothing's left but that genuine pure faith and he'll test our faith because he's working with us because he's trying to give us his kingdom he's trying to give us his inheritance a little bit now and all of it later even in james chapter one it says this blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test he will receive the crown of life which is promised to those who love him so if you're being tested good if you're going through trials, great. If you're going through suffering, great. You know why? God is testing you to see if you can handle the crown of life and the blessings of the inheritance on the other side of your trial. So if you're going through it right now, you have a living hope that when you go through your trial, it's worth it on the other side. And that is good news for a change. That is great news for a change. Then Peter even says, this, he's t- talking about the end of things. He says, and as you're tested, and that faith is genuine, it's more precious than gold, and it'll be revealed to the final outcome of when Jesus returns, the outcome, the salvation of your souls, which means our living hope will be fulfilled completely when Jesus returns. There is no other place, no other place you can place your hope where it's guaranteed to be fulfilled. There's no other investment you can make where you are guaranteed a return on your investment. The only place you can find a guarantee for your investment is when you let your life die so you can be resurrected with Christ. Then it's guaranteed to be fulfilled. I think one of the problems with this is we preach a short-sighted gospel. And I was convicted this last year, that we preach a gospel that stops at the resurrection. But the good news doesn't stop after the resurrection. The good news was then go wait for the Holy Spirit, which is a foretaste of the guarantee of the kingdom to come. Then you go throughout the rest of the gospel, they're preaching over and over again the second coming. See, the gospel's not finished at the cross. The gospel's not finished at the resurrection. The gospel's not finished till Jesus comes back to pick up his bride and take us home. That is what it's called. One in 30 scriptures in the New Testament talk about the second coming. But we don't talk about the second coming very much. And I think it's because we're so caught up looking backwards, we don't look forward. And the gospel looks backwards at the life of Jesus, but looks forward at the return of Jesus. At the return of Jesus, no matter what I'm going through now, I know my hope's going to be fulfilled when he comes back. I know my hope is going to take care of itself. I look at it like this, and 
I, I won't say this is heresy, but I look at it as the, the, the second coming of Jesus is almost like the prodigal son story in reverse. If you remember the prodigal son story, the son gets an inheritance. He leaves his father. He leaves his brother. And he goes off. He lives his best life. He's living it up. He's drinking it up. He's partying it up. He's running off with women. and He runs out of money. He finds himself literally in a pigsty. In a pigsty. And one moment he had this wake up moment, this aha moment. He said, even my dad's servants are treated better than this. Maybe if I go home, Maybe my dad will let me be a servant. He got up out of the pigsty and he starts walking home. And it says the dad saw him from a far way off. Meaning I believe that dad every single day that his son was gone came out to the road and looked out and said, is today the day my son comes home? Is the day the day my boy comes home? Is the day the day I get to see my boy? I think every day and then finally one day he looks out and he sees his boy. And he runs and he meets him with an embrace. He takes a robe and covers up his slime, covers up his filth, covers up his shame, covers him up, puts on a ring to signify he's my boy. Then he kills the fatted calf and they have a party. But I think the second coming is that in reverse. Where the dad comes, the dad gives us some of the inheritance, and then the dad has to go away. Jesus came, he gave us some of the inheritance through his Holy Spirit. Then he says, I have to go away, but I'm coming back. And I think when he comes back, he's looking for sons and daughters who just like the father would come out and look every day is the day the day. I think God is looking for sons and daughters to step out on the road and say, it's today the day my daddy comes home. I think he's looking for people prepared and ready to say, I want my daddy to come back. I want to see my daddy. I think he's looking for people that when he comes, they run to embrace him and throw the robe upon him, throw the ring upon him, and throw a big banquet supper, potluck, wedding supper of the lamb for daddy when he comes home. I think he's looking for people to see their hope fulfilled when he comes back. And I, I believe we're in a culture where the second coming is neglected for right now. We preach a gospel to make me feel good right now. Peter's preaching a gospel that may not make you feel good right now, but it'll make you feel good in eternity. And I think it's time to start looking for a daddy to come back home. When I was, I think, 13, me and my dad lived by ourselves, single dad, lived in a little bitty two-bedroom duplex in kind of a rougher area of town. And my dad worked all the time, and he'd work on Saturdays trying to make money. And so I just raised myself, learned how to cook, and I rode my bicycle everywhere. And me and some buddies on my basketball team found out there was a store that would sell people underage tobacco products and alcohol. So my dad was going to be working one Saturday. Some of my buddies came over, got on their bicycles, got up all the money we could get, pennies and quarters and dollars and whatever we had. We rode to this gas station. We go to the gas station. We're nervous. Maybe we're going to get arrested. We start looking at all the wine coolers and Zimas, filling up everything we could get. Go up to the cash register, push our Zimas and Jolly Ranchers and wine coolers up, said, can I get a pack of those cigarettes? Can I get a pack of that dip? Can I get some of those cigars? And they're just selling us everything. We put our little bitty money up, pennies, counting quarters, pushing them across. We get it, load up our backpacks, sound like jingle bells, walking out of the store with all the bottles, kind of clinking. Get on our bicycles, we're pulling off to the house. There's a buddy in front of me in the bike. It looked like a choo-choo train. He had this huge cigar hanging out of his mouth, puffing smoke. I thought, man, we're the coolest dudes in the neighborhood. Like, I thought we were it. We go home. We get to the dining room table. I'm sitting here. My other two buddies are across the table. We got some wine coolers cracked on. We got some Zimas. I remember one buddy had a cigarette in his mouth, a dip in his mouth, a Zima in one hand, and a cigar in the other. I thought, man, this dude is cool. And so we're sitting there thinking we're tough 13-year-olds. And all of a sudden, I heard some jingling at the door. Right? So my dad wasn't supposed to come home for couple more hours then I see a silhouette through the door and it's my dad so we grab everything we can up and we start running to the back of the house to my bedroom hiding the stuff and I told my dad hey can you take us to the mall jump in the car get to the mall they get out of the car he said Bobby I need you to stay in the car for a minute I said okay he said hey I know you were smoking I was like smoking who are you talking to I went smoking what are you talking he said Bobby I know that you were smoking I said, Dad, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, Bobby, I saw a trail of cigarettes from the dining room table all the way back into your room when I got home. 
So I guess when we scooped up our stuff, we just dropped a trail of clues all the way to the room. So my dad said these words. He said, listen, it's probably not a good habit to start. I probably wouldn't start it. And I thought back to that date, and I thought, one, I, I wish my dad would have gave me better advice than that. But two, I thought back to something my pastor said when he said it's better to live ready than to get ready. It's better to live ready than to get ready. Instead of trying to get ready and clean up my stuff when my daddy was coming home, it's better to live a life that is ready and expecting for him to return. He is coming. It's not doomsday preaching. It's hope preaching. Like it's not about judgment. It's not about doom. It's about when my daddy comes home, he's going to clean up all this mess. COVID is gone. Murder is gone. Abortion is gone. Fear is gone. Cancer is gone. When my daddy comes home, he's cleaning up the mess. Even in Revelation, John is having this revelation of what it's going to look like. Here's what he says. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Meaning she was prepared for daddy to come home. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every single tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away and a new thing has come. Disease will be abolished. Death will be destroyed. And I feel like it's the opposite. When, when they try to put Jesus in the tomb and lock away hope, and he bursts through, I think when Jesus comes back this time, he takes Satan, he takes sin, he takes death, he locks it up in the tomb, he seals the tomb, and he laughs his rear end off. He reverses the game. And I'll tell you what, that's good news for a change. If you're crying, that's good news. If you're mourning, that's good news. If you're dealing with sickness, that's good news. If you're dealing with death, that is good news. Because when he comes back, he's restoring everything to the way he wanted it to be originally. My hope is living, and my hope will be fulfilled in Jesus. So if you will, wherever you're at, I just want you to just take a moment. I just want you to close your eyes. And here's the question I'm going to ask you. Every kid, every family that's there, I just want you to close your eyes. I want you to ask this question. Are you ready for daddy to come home? See, it's not enough just to say, you know, I need to be forgiven of my sins and I want to feel good, better about my shame or my guilt. But is your, t- is your faith being tested and being genuine? And you can answer that question by saying, if I'm ready for him to come home, that means my faith is genuine. If I'm ready for daddy to come back home, I'm waking up every day looking down the road in expectation for my prodigal father to come back and pick up his kids. Are you ready? Are you ready for that day when all the old things pass away and all the new things come? See, our our inheritance, our inheritance is not about the best life now. It's about the best life for eternity. And it's a hope you can hang your hat on. You can place your hopes in Jesus. You can do it before the cross, you can do it at the cross, but now that he's resurrected, you know without a doubt he is who he said he was. So I'm just going to lead you through a question. If you say, you know what, maybe I'm not ready. Maybe you've been in church for a long time, and maybe you've been going through the traditions, or maybe you just happened to come on this online experience, and maybe you say, you know what, my faith isn't genuine. It, when God squeezes me, things I don't like come out. And then maybe I'm not ready. Today is the day to get ready. He is risen, he is resurrected, and he's coming back. Father, we thank you for a hope that is eternal, a hope that supersedes and transcends everything we're facing right now in this life. We thank you for a hope that passes by death, that passes over the grave, that passes over suffering, that passes over sickness, that is an eternal hope that is imperishable, that is undefiled and unfading. And we thank you, Father, that we can place our trust and faith in you. And right now, Father, on this Resurrection Sunday, for all those who say they're not ready, Father, I pray as they confess their sins to you, as they acknowledge that they're not ready, Father, I pray you wash them in the blood of your son, Jesus. Cleanse them from the inside out, so that way when they're tested, 
the pure water of your spirit comes out. Father, helping them get ready for the day that their daddy comes back home to fix every pain, to solve every problem, to heal every disease, and to take us home with him forever and all of eternity to receive our full inheritance. So we thank you for everything that you've done. And we celebrate the resurrection, but we'll also look forward to the second coming. And we thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Come on, church. What a, what a great, great, powerful word today. We have a living hope. We have a living hope. And it is good news for a change. I want to remind you of just a few things real quick. Don't forget, we're asking everybody to fill out the connection card. So if you would, just fill that out for us. And if you're good, you can say, hey, I'm good. I'm good, Chapel family, and that's okay. But if you need some special needs during this time, make sure you let us know. We want to connect with you. And also, those of you that are new to Chapel, maybe you've just started coming around the last few weeks as we've had our online campus going, we want to encourage you to fill out the Next Steps card. Fill out that Next Steps information. It's in the comments right there at Church Online. Pastor Bobby and Miss Toya want to connect with you this week, answer any questions you may have, and just encourage you as well. And then also, we want to see you today. So make sure you take a picture with you and your family. Make sure you post it on social media and use the hashtag Chapel Easter 2020. One more time, hashtag Chapel Easter 2020. Man, we love you, church. We are praying for you. And we know this. God's still going to move. God's still going to do his work. And we know that this Easter, God is moving in a powerful way. So thank you for being with us today here at Chapel. We're praying you have an amazing week ahead. We'll see you next week at Church Online. See you guys.